uh, yeah, all right guys, so as you know, today we will be talking about Karpov, uh, of course, the great world champion. And um, I'm actually just gonna start with one of his most famous combinations. I'm sure a few of you guys have seen it already, but don't spoil it for, for anyone who hasn't seen it, because I want to give you guys a chance to, to find it for yourselves. Um, but if you have seen it, you can let me know, you know, privately. <laughs> um, but as you guys are thinking about this one, let's talk a little bit about who uh, Karpov was. And let me let me ask you guys in the chat, what do you know about the great Anatoly Karpov? What have what have you heard? Yeah, good job, Darren. <laughs> he is famous for losing to Kasparov. You guys always know who they're famous for losing to. <laughs> He won the world championship for free since Fisher was a no-show. Very true, very true. Um, he defeated Korchnoi right in a candidates match in 1974 uh, at the time for the right to challenge Fisher. And little did they know that was actually going to be the de facto world championship match in 1974 because whoever won that one would go on to challenge Fisher. Fisher, of course, uh, wouldn't have it, wouldn't agree to a match, and ended up forfeiting the uh, the title. Kind of a bummer, actually. Karpov always said that he regretted not being able to play Fisher because that would have been such a great uh, experience to play against one of the best players of all time, really high-level match. No one really knew whether Karpov would be the stronger player or Fisher would kind of have uh, more experience and outplay him. Um, but yeah, kind of a bummer. We never got to see that match uh, happen, unfortunately. So Karpov uh, became world champion in 1975. Of course, held the title for about 10 years, defeating Korchnoi uh, in, in two more matches. Uh, and then, of course, we know what happened with Kasparov in 1985. Kasparov kind of took over. But Karpov continued to be you know, a beast for, for many, many years. This game against Apollov was played in uh, 1994. So a couple of years after Karpov was world champion. And um, okay, Rio is begging begging to explain this one. <laughs> so here we go, Rio. All right, uh, go ahead. Knight f6. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're four king knights. So he has to play king takes f6. His queen has to up is in knight e8. After king f6, we go bishop e5 check. So knight f6, I mean, really nice move drawing the king out because both of black's pieces are under attack. And then bishop e5, double check. King takes. Mm -hmm. has to do that. Queen takes e4, king takes e4. Rook e1, and then we take on e8 and double attack. And then rook takes e8 at the end, and we have rook for two pieces, but we're winning one back, so it's going to be uh, extra exchange. So game continue. Bishop e6, takes, takes, rook c8. And Tapala resigned because White's rook is just way too strong in, in this position. Um, yeah, okay, good job, Rio. Nice, very nice combination. Just want to get this one out of the way. Just, it's so pretty. Like, I think everyone needs to see this move on the board at least once <laughs> in their lifetime. Very, very nice. Of course, another point here. Queen takes f3. Met with knight takes e8 in between move. Very important detail. Otherwise, this whole thing would not work. Um, and then after king takes f6, bishop e5. And yeah, so the thing is, I mean, people say Karpov is a very uh, positional, strategic player. He's known for being very good with like prophylaxis and stuff. But as you guys will see, he could also calculate uh, quite quite a bit. And he was uh, pretty sharp when it came to certain kinds of tactics, as, as we'll see. Um, so this very nice detail here with bishop e5. And... Uh, and the skewer and the double attack at the end. So many motifs in one. It's in one combination. It's uh, it's crazy. <laughs> um, okay, now here's the funny thing. So this game was played against Veselin Topalov, 1994, and uh, Karpov actually had a second brilliancy against Topalov, also in 1994. So I'm going to ask you guys which game you're more impressed by. This one with the nice combination or the following game that we're going to take a look at. Um, so let's start from a little bit back. 
And so this is again Karpov playing white against the same opponent, Topalov. Um, and uh, we have kind of interesting position. I would say most people like white's uh, space advantage here. Nice bishop on, on g2. Black is a little bit passive. But let me ask you guys to think about the position for a minute and come up with some kind of plan for white. How should we continue? Okay, a lot of good suggestions actually, <laughs> a lot. So a few of you guys like f5, which uh, certainly uh, does make sense, sacrificing a pawn to try to get queen h6. And yeah, looking for, for some chances on, on the king side. We would want to kind of calculate this out a little bit further before we give up a pawn, but certainly a very, very reasonable um, idea. There's also a suggestion for knight d5 which is also very annoying. It shows how, how many good moves there are for white in the position, also annoying for black. Takes, takes, this knight is hanging, and bishop on e7 is hanging. Maybe black plays like, let's say, bishop f6 here. Takes, takes. Not sure exactly how big white's advantage is in this position, because uh, I think the bishop on f6 is kind of pretty solid, but definitely interesting continuation as well. Uh, and then there was the idea to play c5, so black can't take because bishop on d7 maybe goes d5 and knight b5, and trying to use a d4 square, maybe d6 square. Like if a6, probably knight to d4, and kind of playing against the bad light squared bishop. Uh, totally reasonable as well. I would definitely give white uh, a clear advantage here. Yeah. Uh, okay, so there are lots of ways to play the position. I really just wanted to, to hear you guys' thoughts. Karpov comes up with another move, he goes h4. Not that this move is necessarily stronger, just this is his choice, and I think it's definitely interesting. His idea is just to play h5 and kind of soften up the pawn on g6. And nowadays, whenever we see a pawn on g6, it, it often makes sense to play h4, h5, and, and just weaken this one slightly. And, and we'll see it kind of uh, pay off. Um, so, game continues. Whoops, that's the wrong one. Uh, a6, h5, b5, so black playing for counterplay, h takes g6, h takes g6. Okay guys, white to play. How would you continue here?
Okay, a lot of good suggestions, guys. Sorry, I can't respond to uh, everyone. But Karpov here ends up going knight c5. Kind of a cute trick. Just taking advantage of hanging bishop on d7. And he was very good at spotting just like these very simple ideas. And now black has to worry, for example, not just this one, but also knight takes a6 and c takes b5. Um, so he was really, really a master of finding these like very, very quick tactics and using tactics to achieve uh, positional goals, which we'll see as well. Um, so very annoying move. Black has to take this one, or decides to take. Queen takes d7. And now white's queen is ripped open. The bishop is wide open as well. Uh, everything hanging in black's position. Topolov goes rook c8. Mm, was b4 possible there? Let's see. Oh, at this point, Austin? Yeah, a lot of stuff hanging. <laughs> a lot of stuff hanging. There's like this, 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 this. But we got to count. So take, 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 take. That's hanging with check. So that's probably no good. That's an exchange. Maybe just take and then white recaptures, yeah? Right. And then c6 is hanging, and yeah, we win at least the exchange here. Yeah, looks looks pretty good. Um, so takes, takes, rook c8. Okay, so first question, guys, here should be what happens on bishop takes c6? Why isn't this just free piece? Hmm, so some of you guys are saying rook c7. Is this something white should be worried about? <laughs> or alternate question, white to play? Queen c7, yeah, absolutely. And white has two rooks and a minor piece for the queen, so basically decisive advantage. But instead, rook a7 is actually, is actually a big problem. And queen can't hold on to the bishop, we have to go back. Next move, black plays rick takes c6, and things are, things are not that bad. Okay, so what should white do instead? Let me let you guys think about it.
Okay, guys, thanks for submitting your um, your moves. I mean, I'm only giving you guys like one to two minutes, so it's not like I'm expecting you guys to find every single move, but let me call on Austin here. Austin, go ahead. So uh, as everybody probably noticed, the issue with taking the knight is rook a7. Basically, it's just the queen doesn't have a square. So uh, there is a way to create a square, and that move is rook takes e6. So the basic idea is if black takes this one, then after we take back, now we can take the knight, and uh, we hold on to the bishop, and black's just completely busted. Because in opposite color bishops, we're just essentially up a piece, because that bishop on e7 is going to defend, it's not going to be able to defend the king. And then all three of white's major, black's major pieces are kind of over there too, so it's going to be an easy win. And, uh, the critical test might be if black plays rook a7 instead of taking the rook first. So you need to look for a response there, but I think after rook a7, we can just take the pawn on g6 and then transpose into the other line. Um, because if f takes g6 and queen to e6 check, and then we basically have the same thing. Maybe it's a little bit better for black, but it still looks pretty bad. Right. Yeah, very good. A exactly. Good Good point there on rook a7. Um, it's kind of critical that we have this move. It's a very clean way of just getting the job done. And then your evaluation is right. White gets the exchange, but with the light squared bishop, it's almost like white can attack with the knight and with the bishop here, and it's going to be very, very difficult for black to... Um, defend this one. So good job. Actually, uh, Karpov uh, is pretty well known for being very, very good in positions with opposite colored bishops. This maybe can be counted as one of the games, but he actually has a lot of very nice end games um, with, with opposite colored bishops that he ends up winning. I'll show you guys one that I was really impressed by. Um, so yeah, rook takes e6, just breaking everything open on the light squares and um, black pieces, of course, all on this side of the board. Um, you guys are like, I thought Karpov was a positional player. <laughs> like, well, I mean, the, the position called for a sacrifice. So that's um, <laughs> that's what he, he did. Um, let me get back to the game here. So rook a7 indeed played by black. Rook takes g6. Um, takes, queen e6 check, king g7. Takes on c6, rook to d8 takes on b5 and now white is actually i mean trying to be up in material if we can collect another pawn or two i mean the extra exchange is just going to be a huge advantage so things are just very very difficult here for black already play bishop f6 knight e4 uh bishop d4 if he takes this one then simply rook b1 bishop moves b6 and this b pawn becomes really really strong i mean white's queen totally dominating everything um so just bishop d4 right away takes on a6, queen b6, rook d1, queen takes a6. Okay, now next move, white to play. Let me give you guys some time to think about it again. How should we proceed in this position?
Okay, let me call on Ashish. Ashish. Okay. Mm -hmm. Alright, so I said Rook D4 since that Bishop is too strong and it's like the only defense for like Black, so sounds like CD4. I looked at Queen E5. Mm-hmm. I guess, okay, King G8, I guess. Yeah. I have, I have bishop d5 check at least. Yeah, a lot of options. I mean, here we, we have this one as well. Simple, just going after the rook. Um, oh, yeah, that's true. If you want. So critical is what happens on, let's say, rook takes d4, because this is how black at least keeps the material. Mm, how do you think white should continue here? Uh, I guess um, Queen E5. Mm -hmm. Like, like um, I don't know, King F8 looks horrible. King H6 <laughs> also. Yeah. A uh, King H. Let's say King G8. I'm looking at knights, knight c5. <laughs> Greedy. <laughs> oh no, there's rook d1. This one. I mean. Yeah, rook d1 is there. Well, uh, so what? I mean, it's just a check, king h2. But the bishop is hanging, right? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you're right. Yeah, then that that's a big deal. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to take this one. I think we give checks here, like yeah, bishop, bishop d5. d5, yeah. For example. Right, and. King comes this way. We essentially get similar to uh, the game, but probably stronger to give Queen F6 check. Okay, uh, nice job. Oh, Daniel's here as well. Um, oh, whoops, sorry. Uh, what about Knight F6 after Queen E5? Let's take a look. Probably possible. Let's see here. Um, Let's say king f8. Take care, maybe. If white wins back one exchange, then it's like we have um, like four pawns <laughs> for, for the exchange. So that would just be decisive material advantage. So. Yeah, this might just be simple, and then just taking on, on d4. Um, so yeah, probably knight f6 is is good too. And king f7, uh, bishop e8, kind of same thing. Um, so yeah, very nice second exchange sack. Rook takes d4. I mean, first white wins the battle for the light squares. Now, wins the battle for uh, the dark squares as well. And queen, bishop, and knight are just super super strong uh, when they're coordinated like this. Um, so. White goes queen f6 check, king g8, takes this one with check. And uh, now the king is, of course, completely open. Queen e5, king g8, we get our knight f6. King f7, bishop e8 check, uh, king f8, and we basically end up here. Queen d6, queen takes a7, black is left without any pawns. Queen takes f6, and then bishop h5. Silky smooth, <laughs> you know, classy Karpov, just getting rid of the check. Now white has five pawns for the exchange, black's king completely open, and yeah, game is over. B2, king g2, and uh, black resigned. No more moves. Yeah. Um, okay, so two very uh, impressive games, both unfortunately against Topalov. 1994, this was like young Topalov, right? A few years later, he would become... Uh, yeah, like one of the world's uh, most dangerous players ever. Um, so, which one do you guys prefer? Do you guys like do you guys like the knight of six combo or second game? 
with the exchange sacks. Looks like a lot of votes for the second game. Yeah, I mean, first one was kind of shorter. Right. Right, but second game is like kind of this drawn out battle. But the first one, I remember seeing that when I was like pretty young, Night F6, like, I was very impressed. I was like, how do, how do you even come up with such a tactic? Like, Knight of Six, and then you have to see Bishop E5. Unfortunately, guys, I, I, I don't have pull powers. I think only Greg does, because he has, like, the master Zoom account. But it sounds like the second game is is uh, is people's favorite. Yeah, Karpov had uh, a number of good attacking games. We're not going to look at the famous Karpov Korshna game and the Dragon, but I would encourage you guys to go look that one up, especially if you're an E4 player and you have to face the Sicilian Dragon. Karp of Korshnoi, 1974, maybe one of the best um, Sicilian, open Sicilian attacking dragon games ever. Um, but let's move on to another game. I mentioned that Karpov was very, very good uh, in positions with um, bishops of opposite color. I want to put one position on the board here. And um, before I tell you who's playing, who's playing which color, uh, so this wasn't Karpov to Polov, it was uh, two different players. I want to ask you guys about this position. Uh, with white to play, it's white's move. How do you evaluate this position on the board? How do you evaluate this end game? Is it equal? Is someone better? If someone is better, then by how much better? Slightly better, clearly better. You can give me a computer evaluation if you want. I'm just curious how you guys would evaluate this position. Okay, Rio says 0.77. See one vote for equal. One vote for black is slightly better. Someone says white should be better with the chance to make outside pass pawn. Rio has seen everything. It's not fair, Rio. <laughs> um, what what Magnus book was this in? I don't understand. Why would this be in a Magnus book? <laughs> this game really influenced him or something. Okay, Austin says black is better because it's easier to attack the f2 pawn and make use of the kingside majority. Yeah, actually, so you guys are are, are basically right. Um, so this is the game. Actually, let me let me put the whole game in. This is the game uh, Ultraman versus Karpov. Ultraman is a strong grandmaster in his own right. Um, and let's go to that key position. Actually, it wasn't really a key position. It was just kind of the start of this end game. Earlier, we just had like double brooks. White decided to trade off a pair of rooks, and then we get this position with white to move after um, king to g7, and it feels extremely equal, opposite color bishops. Um, but as you guys have realized, like white's queenside majority is actually kind of stuck. It's very very difficult to get the pawns moving. Like you can't go a3, you can't go a4. I mean, the the bishop is basically just holding it down. Whereas black's kingside majority is still very much mobile and black can push these pawns forward. And because of this, black actually has kind of a small and nagging advantage. Objectively, I think it's still gonna be very close to equal here. Like white should be able to draw with perfect play. Um, but as we'll see, it, it's it's difficult to, to defend this one perfectly. And um, we can see how Karpov ends up uh, winning it because I think it's very impressive. So white goes rook c2, covering the, the second rank, not allowing black, of course, to set up like rook d2, bishop c5, and, and win the game, you know, with, with ease. Um, but king f6, so this is where black starts starts to kind of massage. Bishop e2, rook comes back. h4, e5. h5, white tries to trade off some pawns. King to g5. So what's the best way to defend here? I'll kind of show you guys um, at, at which point I think white um, goes beyond 
uh, beyond saving it. But basically, black just starts improving very, very slowly here. e4, king e5, and white has nothing to do but sit and wait. And finally, Karpov is, is pushing, pushing, pushing. Um, and I think actually, I think at this point, right when black played e4, this is where white needed to play a move like f3. So this is how white could have, I think, saved this game. The point is later white plays f3 and black advances e3, but here white can push f4 and not let black secure this pawn. So black can still go bishop to d2, but that's not exactly the easiest uh, blockade to, to win. Um, yeah, <laughs> Casa is exactly right. When people analyze like classic games, they rarely look at <laughs> they rarely look at the like the defender's point of view. Yeah, I think this is around here, like the last point that white can kind of save it with this idea of not giving black this kind of free uh, protected passer. Uh, because ultimate keeps shuffling, allows black to get g5 in. Rook h6, okay, repeats a couple times, and now f4. And uh, now, okay, f3 is a big threat, white goes f3 here, e3, and now white plays g4. So black has achieved quite a bit here, but now it's time to make a decision how to continue. Uh, obvious move is rook to d2, but do we really want to trade rooks here? That's the question. So question for you guys, how should black continue? Okay, so yeah, we're not really seeing a way to get in without this rook d2 move, and this is exactly it's exactly the point. Not so easy for black to make progress without this next idea. And so Karpov does go ahead and play rook to d2, breaking the rule that you're not supposed to trade rooks, right, with opposite color bishops. Generally, when you trade pieces here, it's going to be giving the defender better chances. But we're getting our pawn to d2, and black's king is now going to be able to come in. Now, it isn't easy to win this one from here. It still takes quite a bit of uh, precision, but the idea is absolutely 100% sound. So bishop d1, king d4, king f2, king c3, king e2, king b2, king d3. Okay, guys, black to play. Very critical moment here. If we play king to c1, of course, that's going to be met with king to e2. And so we need a way to make progress. If we take the pawn, white goes king c2. And our king is going to have a hard time getting out. So what to do? Okay. Mm, very nice line from Arnov. Arnov, you should really be sending your line just to me, but let's like a, take a look at your really nice line. So king c1, king e2, bishop c3, and now if white goes a3, we go bishop b4. If take, take.
and indeed winning. Uh, that's it. Loses the bishop, game over. D pawn is too strong. However, let's pause here. Let's put ourselves in white shoes. <laughs> yeah, very good, Alex, Kelsey, Daniel. Yep, B4. And just like that, white can, white can save the game. Because now the bishop can shuffle on this diagonal. Let's say take, we go bishop a4. If king b2, we'll play here. And then we want to come behind the pawn. And that's it. This is what a fortress can look like. Yeah, so, and this is why, this is why positions without rooks are harder to win. Because if you still had a rook, you're like completely winning, right? I mean, this pawn is so strong. You would never lose with this pawn on d2. But without rooks, these blockades are more possible. And yeah, black doesn't win here. So we have to be very, very precise. And now, of course, I'm only giving you guys like a minute <laughs> to make a move. So don't worry about it. But in a game, if you have time in this position, you really have to spend time and be extremely, extremely precise. Okay, so what about triangulation? Well, who here thinks they have a winning idea for black? Be careful not to lose the pride of your position. <laughs> okay, let me call on Alex. Okay, so here you want to play king b1 because here, if he plays a3, then you can, if he plays, okay, well, first if he plays something like king e2, you obviously play king c1. Mm -hmm. And, okay, he can't play a4, but can he play, no, he cannot play a4, right? No. Well, let, let's just uh, take a look. So if, if a4, a4 yeah. then you just go here, right? Yeah. So a3 is, I guess, the only one. Mm -hmm. But now let's say let's say b4 here. b4 takes... If you take with bishop, then bishop b3. So that couldn't work, right? Because... Yeah, I don't think it works if you take with the bishop. So you gotta take with the... If you take with the bishop, it doesn't work. If bishop b3... He goes back and forth. Yeah. So let's try this one. Let's say a5. We go and here. You gotta bring the bishop to e3 and then put move the king back to, I guess, c3 or a3. And then push the pawn again. Right, and then this so one is two coming. Two pawns is too much for. Yeah, like, so white can try like this one, right? To take one pawn, but. Yeah, but. This, um. I, 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 but the problem is that his, you could just play, I guess, bishop e3 now. Oh, wait, it's white's move, so. Um, yeah, we, we actually get something similar to this uh, in the game. So this one, I think, is actually winning winning for black. Because uh, basically, it's just king a2, b2, and white can't really cover the b1 square more than once. So he's going to have to give up the uh, the bishop for it. Um, so, so this one is good. Let's go back. Um, let's so. say... A3 is like the second move I see here. I mean, you can play A3 now, but I guess you could play King 2 first. But you, you can play King 2, but I mean, I guess. No, let's sort of just play A3 now. Let's yeah, let's say A3. Absolutely critical. <laughs> so I guess this just. If you play King C1, I guess you could play King C1. But it doesn't work. King, King C1, one. you must play King E2, because there's no other choice. Unless you could play Bishop E2, maybe. Well, so let's say, what about takes here? If he takes on king d1 then. And king d1 and black is much faster. Yeah, right. can stop this, it's just too much. So king b1, yeah, a3 and then king c1. Very important. He just transposes, so he must be bishop b2. Hmm, okay, let's say bishop b2. So here, okay, king d1's not that good. Bishop, king c2 is not interesting. Yeah, just simple. Why well, can't oh, yeah, stop the pawn? Yeah, <laughs> just game over. So any bishop move there is good. 
So, well, critical again is king e2, but we already looked at this line right here. We can, oh, well, yeah. here we can just take. And uh, actually, this was the game. B4, a okay. takes b4. Yeah, this is this is winning. This gives no chances at all. Ship a4 and yeah, completely okay. win it. And I like what Karpov does here. He's like, go ahead and take it. I don't even need the pawn. He just goes king b2. White goes king d1 for some reason. I'm not sure. B3. <laughs> it's just game over here, here, and it was it was resigns because no way to stop the the pawn anymore. Okay, good job, Alex. Very nice. Um, so yeah, basically this uh, triangulation. This is the key idea, and this is an end game that I think so easy to mess up. Like nine out of ten players, maybe ninety five out of a hundred would just play king c one, king e two, and then get stuck, like not sure what to do, um, and probably fall into some kind of fortress like like this where, where black doesn't win. Um, but uh, yeah, very, very precise. King b1 and white simply just, just is running out of moves. Nothing to do. King e2, king c1 and game over. That's true. You can go back <laughs> after king c1. You can go back and repeat the position. But if you don't find it the first time, you might not find it the, the second time either. Um, but yeah, very, very nice uh, technique here at the end. Okay, guys, I want to show you my... Um, favorite Karpov game. Um, as I mentioned, Karpov was really good, in my opinion, at like, like finding these like little tactical justifications for the, you know, strategic goals that he wanted to achieve in the position. Um, so this is a really interesting game he played against Joel Lautier. And I want to start from this moment here. Uh, let me just ask you guys quickly, one minute, what would you play for white in, in this position? Morphe's a good player. I mean, it's just everyone's seen his games already. You know, they're kind of overdone. But Morphe was really strong. Very strong, of course. It's just we've all seen his games. So, <laughs> sick of it. Sick of it. Okay, so some ideas for c5. This is a thematic move in these positions. Um, but I'm not sure we quite get enough here after takes, takes, and uh, queen takes c5. Um, it can be a positional sack in this kind of position and White's main idea is some of you guys I think have figured out is we need to keep this bishop on b7 passive so this whole game Karpov is basically playing against this light squared bishop keep that in mind he's playing against the bishop so he starts with knight e5 
I saw a few suggestions for knight g5, but this one probably is met with knight f6. And queen h4, you know, h6, something like this. And kingside attack is not really going to be very successful here. You just don't have enough, uh, enough pieces there. Um, so knight e5. And uh, he invites black to take on e5, which he does. D takes e5. And queen c7. So black defends the bishop and prepares this move c5. And, and basically in this structure, it's all about the c5 break. If black can play this one, then he'll likely equalize. If not, uh, then white keeps some pressure. So bishop f3. Karpov just pins it. And now black goes bishop a8. And once again, he's turning c5. Probably he was counting on this move. And if we go c5 ourselves, this is possible. And this is, again, very thematic. It, it's not exactly a winner for white because we also give up the d5 square. So this isn't necessarily going to be that, that easy for white. So here, I really like what, what Karpov does. Um, and we're running low on time, so I'm going to go through this part. He takes on d8, rook takes d8, and rook d1. Yeah, exactly, Austin. It feels very simple, like, okay, he's just trading rooks. <laughs> boring, boring, boring. But he doesn't let black play c5, right? Because now c5, we take on d8, take on a8. And if rook takes d1, as in the game, bishop takes d1, well, now uh, bishop on a8 is hanging, so c5 still can't be played. Okay, so here black goes queen d8. Defending and attacking d1. White plays bishop f3. The goal, the goal is clear, just play against the bishop. Don't let black play c5. But in doing all this, he now allows black to play queen d2. And now black's queen is actually super active and, and black is ready to just start taking pawns. Okay, bishop is bad, but if black can take a pawn or two and, and drop back with the queen, I mean, that's that's not something we just want to allow. Okay, Karpov goes b3. I really like what he does here. Uh, queen takes a2, b4. And now he plays for b5, which is, is pretty scary. Uh, so queen a1 check, king h2, queen a6. And he could have played b5 here, but I'm guessing he didn't like this. And then black just kind of does nothing. And he wasn't quite sure maybe how to break through. I think this was why he didn't like it, although I would still say white has uh, really good chances here. But what he does is actually, I think, really interesting as well. Queen d4. Queen c8 c5. So white's down a pawn. We're now playing this like positional pawn sacrifice style. But finally he gets the c5 break. b takes c5, queen takes c5, keeping the pressure on. And threatening b5. So black has to go kind of ugly move a6, locking in the bishop. Now queen e7, uh, hitting the back rank. Black goes g6. Okay, white, what should white do next? Any guesses here? Real quick, guys, first instinct. Black just played g6. h4, good. That was really fast. Nice. Nice. That was like five people who all blitzed uh, h4. Very good. Yeah, h4, absolutely. And this is a very typical question to ask black in this position because if black allows white to get the pawn up to h6, then that's going to be some really serious mating threats against the king. We always have like queen f6 stuff, but even just generally the back rank is always going to be an issue for black. So the long-term queen endgame, really, really difficult with um, the pawn on h6. If black goes c5 here, it's a good question. Uh, I think white takes it and just goes for the queen and pawn endgame, where this c pawn is just going to be uh, really strong. Um, and still like this h5... Um, h6 stuff. So if queen e4, for example, we maybe give check, and we do it with checks. And then maybe h5 here, maybe um, a 
h5 looks kind of annoying, maybe f3. Yeah. If a5... Hmm. Let's see, queen d7, we'll just count it out. a4, c6, right? e3, here, here, and we do it with check. So just <laughs> one tempo, one tempo too fast. So queen d7 here. Queen a5? Hmm. I just don't really believe in it. I think... Um, Like, I feel like we might even be able to push here. Yeah, like takes, we go g3. Black goes after this pawn, but a lot of times you can just like hold it like queen d4. Oh, maybe queen d8 check and then queen d4 with check even. And queen c5. So basically the queen wants to be pushing the pawn and covering the, the main weakness. So should be good for white at this point. Wait, it was a pawn on c7? Hold on. <laughs> Where was the pawn? Oh, you're right. Pawn was on c7. Takes here. Yeah, yeah. Excuse me. This is this is coming with check. Right. So this is this is just over. So black goes h5. It doesn't want to allow it, but we'll see this move comes with its own drawbacks. King g3. Uh, I think this was... Actually, wait, I always have to look this up. Because... Yeah, no, this game, this was after the famous Nigel Short game. Not by much, though. This game was 1992, Short Timon 1991. So this is like a, a nod, right, to Short Timon, Easter egg. And absolutely, I mean, <laughs> that looks pretty dangerous. So black goes queen b7. Okay, now white to play. What should we do here? Okay, so a lot of people are saying put the queen on f6, either queen d8 f6 or queen f6, and try to get the king in. And sure, I mean, this would be fun, but the problem is black, all black needs to do is here and here. And once the king gets to h6, it's just giving you a check. And so it's not actually, <laughs> the idea doesn't actually work in every single um, position. Um, but royal has a really interesting idea. Let me call on royal. Hi. Hello. What are you um, thinking? Mm -hmm. You could trade the queens and then bring the king to the queen side. So queen takes b7, going for the end game. And this is what Karpov does. This is really, really smart because we're down a pawn. It's actually the first time I saw this, I was like blown away. I'm like, what? Like we're we're down a pawn. He just played h4, king g3, and now he trades queens. And this is actually one thing about Karpov that is kind of well known. People would always say like, you know, he could be defending 
the whole game, but as soon as he feels like he has an advantage, he'll switch gears and, and start pushing, and he'll play another 100 moves to grind out the win. Um, or if he's the one on the initiative he and, and suddenly he messes up, now he's defending, he was very good at like pulling the break and making sure he doesn't lose the game. And in, in, in the game, I feel like he was very, very good at like sniffing out these kinds of transitions that really evade most players. And, and this one I thought was really impressive because he goes for this end game. There's actually a number of winning plans here, but um, the one Royal suggested is, is quite good. Uh, king f4, king f8. Let's say, for example, white heads for the queen side, and we get some position like this. Here, basically, black is tied down defending this one. Notice black never played c5. This bishop is just pinned uh, the whole game. And uh, now, basically, the plan for white is to kind of stretch black's defenses uh, with a move like g4. So let's say black shuffles, we play g4. Black keeps shuffling, we play h5, and by doing all this, we create another target for our bishop. And now if black goes king e7, then white's king comes in with king to b6, and this is basically game over. White is, white is taking, finally winning the pawn back, and then it's going to have completely winning uh, bishop endgame. So this was one winning plan. Uh, so nice job, Royal, spotting this one. Karpov plays a different idea that um, Aradia mentions in the chat. Uh, he plays king g5. And we'll see what he's up to in a moment, and we'll see why exactly h4, h5 was such an important inclusion for white. So king e7, he goes bishop e4, bishop a8, black has nothing to do, bishop is just in prison over here, f3. And here Karpov shows he's actually playing for g4, and either black loses the pawn on h5, or he has to take fg and allow white to create an outside h-pawn. Well, the king could have gone to g7, but basically it would have made no difference because black can't really stop this plan. Still white plays bishop e4, f3, g4. Either black loses the pawn or has to take, then white gets h5, takes, takes, h6 check, and the king will walk into f6. And basically we have like our typical outside pass pawn, like when you have in king and pawn endgames, king just walks into the other side of the board and, and wins. So very, very good, you know, understanding to, to go for this endgame, knowing that it's going to be winning. Then of course his technique is basically perfect. Takes, takes. He doesn't take right away because then black would get f5 and it's slightly uncomfortable. It's just like slightly, slightly uncomfortable to allow this, even though white is still winning. Instead, he just plays f4 and just prepares to take on h5 at a time when now black can no longer play f5 and do anything here. White would just play king g6 and walk the h-pawn in, and, and that's going to be game over. So very, very impressive game. I mean, the whole game just playing against this one bishop on b7, really one of my favorites. Um, starting with this decision, rook takes d8 and rook d1, already very non-obvious giving up like the d-file, giving up the pawn, um, and then of course going for this endgame, very very unexpected, but very instructive and shows you guys these uh, same color bishop endgames can be deadly. If, if you have the better bishop, more active king, you could be down a pawn and still uh, completely winning. So okay guys, that's going to wrap it up for this class. Uh, Karpa was an absolute baller lots of brilliant games tons of games we didn't even touch uh, his games against uh, Kasparov and you know guys he was he was leading 5-1 in that first Kasparov match I mean he, he it's because of him that Kasparov became such a good player you know all those lessons from Karpov is what turned Kasparov into a world champion anyway um, <laughs> hope you guys enjoyed the class we will see you uh, back again on uh, Tuesday thanks everyone take care